Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Lucky Lends a Hand, an episode of She-Ra, Princess of Power, produced by Filmation Studios. I think I'm going to attempt to cram a great deal into this commentary, not only because there's a lot to say about this Lucky-themed adventure, but because I know a lot of behind-the-scenes information about this particular episode. I first saw this episode on August the 11th, 1986, I remember recording this episode and enjoying the hell out of it because it was a crossover. And then shortly after, no longer having the episode on tape. But to this day, I still have an audio cassette with a clip I recorded from the TV of the Prince Adam to He-Man transformation. So for the longest time, about 10 years, one brief audio clip was all I ever had of this very episode. The first time I saw this episode again would be 1997, when I was tape trading and someone named, I think the name was Taran Chatterjee, sent me copies of many of the She-Ra Magic Window cassettes. So that was the first time I saw certain episodes like Horde Prime Takes a Holiday and I was reunited with Lucky Lens a Hand. The funny thing is, this episode was released on VHS in the UK, but it was one of the harder to find video cassettes and so I only discovered its existence when the He-Man and She-Ra community began to form online. Within a year and a half of watching this episode for the first time was when I began speaking to Robert Lamb, the writer of this episode. Zadok Angel and I were very much knee deep in constantly putting out content making the He-Man and She-Ra episode review website when Robert got in touch and we've remained friends ever since. Be sure to check out the lengthy interview I have with Robert Lamb on this very channel. This episode was directed by Mark Glamack, who I lump in with the new wave of directors that emerged during She-Ra's first and second season. Tom Sito, Tom Tadaranowitz, Mark Glamack, Bill Nunez, they all appeared to make their directorial debuts around about 1985, having worked at Filmation as storyboard artists and animators. Glamack's episodes always looked really nice and he often featured strong memorable pieces of animation which you will see in this very episode. The idea for an episode featuring Lucky was not the work of Robert Lamb. Rob had pitched numerous script ideas to Executive Vice President of Creative Affairs, the head of the writing department, Arthur Nadell, who had pretty much nixed them all, before suggesting to Robert that he tried to create an episode featuring Lucky, which made the writer wince. At this point in production, Lucky was simply the little creature voiced by Erica Scheimer that would pop up at the end of an episode and deliver a moral segment, sometimes a tad heavy-handed when compared to what we saw in the He-Man series. But no one writing the series had an episode in mind for the little guy. Lucky isn't even present in the series Bible, he's quite literally a character just for the moral segments. That is it. That said, it's kind of easy to figure out the playful nature of the character given that he hides in pretty much every episode. So yeah, Robert was tasked with writing an episode featuring this strange little guy, and he came up with something that made the heads of production smile. How about an episode that features Etheria frozen in time? Nothing but held animation cells. Imagine hearing that story pitched to you as a producer of animation. We're going to make an episode that features a chunk of the story with little to no animation. Think of the money saved on production. That said, and I always love to remind people of this fact, Filmation spent more than any other studio on a single episode of animation during the 80s. Oh, I'm just going to interrupt myself here as we're at the camp of the Great Rebellion and I want to point out one thing. Froster has a horse and thanks to the production material that I've acquired over the years, we know the name of the horse to be Winter. Pretty cool name, right? So yeah, I was talking about how Filmation spent more than any other studio on a single episode of animation during the 80s because they did it all in-house in the United States, whereas many other studios, actually most other studios, send their animation work overseas where, yes, the quality could be better at times, but the labour was far cheaper. The other thing about Lucky Lens a Hand is that, as much as we like to joke that it features a lot of held cells, the budget for the episode is clearly moved into other places. For example, as we're about to see, when Hordak first acquires the Parthax, we see shadows accompany the scene. For those that don't know, shadows were expensive for any studio to accomplish, which is why you rarely see them during this decade of animation. 
Later in the episode, when Lucky appears in the bedroom of Prince Adam, we see a plethora of shadows, and given that Filmation often did these in camera, which meant exposing the film twice but using mats to isolate and expose certain areas, it was a hugely time consuming process. In short, when all was said and done, this episode probably cost about the same as any other episode of the series, regardless of its held cells. Now we're about to see Hordak demonstrate his time stop device. One of the best things about this scene is that upon hearing that Hordak has a delivery, Imp asks if Hordak has ordered something from the Horde catalogue, and it's not impossible to smile at that notion of a Horde catalogue, picturing Horde Prime's operation as an economic conglomerate, dispensing catalogues like a department store. Up until this point in the episode, Hordak has seemed somewhat aloof, but now he comes alive as he tests the time freeze on the helpless Mantena. I should point out here that even though we're in the throne room of the Fright Zone, a place we've been numerous times before, and even though we're with Hordak, Imp and Mantenna, characters who have a wealth of stock animation, much of the sequences you see in these scenes are brand new. As I said, Mark Glamack, the director, often had a desire for new animation. All of the animation of Imp in this scene is new, none of it is stock. And I believe I've said it on other commentaries, but Erica Scheimer's imp voice is one of my favourite performances from her. Her froster, especially in Sweet Bee's Home, is wonderful too. There's just something oddly captivating about that imp voice. You can almost see Erica in the recording booth having a whale of a time. It's funny, as we're about to see from this moment on, both Hordak and she fade from the story. Even Imp has more material, as he gets to share this rather amusing scene with Shadow Weaver. Go on, change! Look, Squirt, you order me one more time and I... Uh, hurry! She's leaving! Imp ordering Shadow Weaver about is fantastic. Go on, change! <laughs> I just love this little scene as Imp is hilarious in his anxiousness and impatience with the more deliberate, thoughtful Shadow Weaver. They both clearly have very different tactics when it comes to this plan. Linda Gary as Shadow Weaver and Erica Scheimer as Imp seem to have a lot of fun with this scene. I'll let a bit of their exchange play out because it is hilarious. Bah! I never trust machines to do magic. <laughs> That's why you fail. You toad! And again, all this animation of Imp is completely new. There's no stock here. And the same can be said for Weaver's rage. A smart writer like Robert Lamb enjoys honing his character's personalities, as we have seen with many of his episodes, and this is one small instance of that. And now, the time stop device has made its way into the rebel camp. Granted, the idea of a machine that freezes time is nothing new in the world of fantasy and science fiction. Time freeze mechanisms have been cartoon staples for decades, but Robert Lamb isn't trying to come up with the most original of ideas. It's the result of the frozen time where his writing focuses and excels. That said, the time freeze plot is new to the realm of He-Man and She-Ra, and at least it's not another capture and rescue scheme from the Horde. Still, the object of Hordak's plan is kind of left hanging. What does he want to do after the Rebels are frozen? If his plan is limited to simply freezing them in time, then for all intents and purposes, Hordak has succeeded by the end of Act 1. His goals thereafter are never actually revealed. Maybe it's just a case of Hordak preventing them from being a nuisance? And this is a great moment in the episode. The time stop device activates and everything stops. Sensibly, there's no music for these initial shots and it's very striking. In animation, it's hard to get the visual of frozen time across to the viewer, but showing the characters once moving, running, but now held in place with no music is perfect. Act one ends with the Horde victorious. And here we are in Act 2. If I may play creative for a second, I think a more striking end to Act 1 would have been to see Adora frozen in time because when we last saw her, she and Swiftwind were escorting Froster back to Castle Chill. I think Adora stood by Swiftwind, maybe in a dramatic upshot, would have been a stronger end to the first act, but hey, that's probably my only fault with the episode. And so yes, here's Lucky. When Lucky jumps out of the tree for that very first time, he discovers that everything is frozen, save for him. We kind of get over our initial shock of Lucky's sudden liberation actually being included in a script by the time he reaches the rebel camp. Now, we should understand what a gigantic risk writer Robert Lamb at the behest of Arthur Nadell is taking in bringing Lucky into the main plot. 
He uses, for the centre of this story, a character pretty disliked by numerous creatives at Filmation. Lou Scheimer, Erica Scheimer, Arthur Nadell and Charles M. Billis, who designed Lucky, all expressed at one time or another their love for the character, but many writers and artists felt him to be a tad forced. The writers felt that Lucky would undermine the moral that they were weaving into the structure of their episode, and the artists grew frustrated at having to put him in every episode. Some directors at times seemingly giving up and having Lucky very obviously on show. Furthermore, Lucky has never been anything more than stock animation. If you watch the she Moral segments, you soon realise that there are only about four or five different animation sequences, if that, of Lucky, and that they are just repeated over and over, from episode to episode. His high squeaky voice, bright colours and obnoxious cuteness really has no place as the star of an episode, and yet, as we shall see, somehow Robert Lamb miraculously pulls it off. Liberated from the moral segments, Lucky becomes more accessible and easier to accept as a character, instead of shaking his finger at we the audience and spouting some good advice. Lucky moves about the Whispering Woods like an innocent child wandering. His high and mightiness is no longer present, and now Lucky is just a pleasant Ethereum woodland creature who hides for fun. And with this scene, Lucky becomes only the fifth character to enter the Crystal Castle, where he's about to learn a rather fantastic secret. Adora is she -Ra. You are the only one who can reach her brother, He-Man. Such a cool moment in the series. Never before has the closely guarded secret been so effortlessly, unexpectedly revealed. Adora is she -Ra? That means that he man is Prince Adam. Here, another one of those unwritten rules, thou shalt not reveal the secret identity, is broken by Robert Lamb's script. He takes a risk in breaking this rule, but it pays off. Again, numerous times in the She-Ra series we enter the Crystal Castle, but on this occasion the director Mark Lamac makes Light Hope's presence all the more impressive with the use of shadows. And now we're going to get one of the best visual reveals of the episode as Light Hope does his best to get Lucky somewhere on Eternia. Anywhere. Cue the Snake Mountain theme. All Eternia is asleep now. Okay, so it's the she version of the Snake Mountain theme, but still. And again, talking about the money saved in producing certain sections of this episode being spent on other scenes, just check out all the lovely new animation coming up in this scene between Skeletor, Beastman and Lucky. There's something truly wonderful about this scene when you think about it. Miserable Beastman. Uh-oh, you're not he -Man. <laughs> It's completely not necessary to the plot in the slightest, but it feels like an important part of the episode. What I've always loved about this scene is that it feels like a mini episode in itself, Skeletor revealing that the crystal he wields will allow him via a portal to enter Prince Adam's bedroom and take him hostage. Had Lucky not shown up, Skeletor no doubt would have actually succeeded in his latest scheme. So not only do we get this mini episode, but it's made all the funnier when Lucky foils it in a matter of mere seconds. As we're about to see. What I also love is that Robert Lamb writes this entire scene with his tongue firmly stuck in cheek. It is obvious he is making fun of the old He-Man formula, which invariably starts with Skeletor announcing to his lackeys his latest scheme. The comedic value of this scene so brightens the episode that it becomes what must be the series' best cameo appearance. It's a known fact that the writers and artists working on She-Ra, Princess of Power missed working on their favourite He-Man and the Masters of the Universe characters, especially Skeletor. So crossover episodes were universally enjoyed by all involved. And within the blink of an eye, our mini-adventure at Snake Mountain comes to a somewhat wonderfully predictable end. And when you think about it, no other half hour in He-Man and She-Ra history packs in virtually all of the principal locations in the series as this one does. No other single episode can boast the use of all six of the most important places on Eternia and Etheria. The Whispering Woods, the Fright Zone, the Crystal Castle, Snake Mountain, the Royal Palace, and as we shall soon see, Castle Greyskull. 
It is amazing that all of these places could appear within the span of a single episode, but Robert Lamb's script pulls off the unthinkable without it feeling remotely cluttered. And look at these utterly gorgeous shadows. Had Filmation ever produced an exclusive He-Man and the Masters of the Universe movie, and trust me, some plans were in the works, there's a future video tease for you, then I would love to think that the visuals would have been as rich as what we see here and throughout this episode. And how bizarre is it seeing Lucky now in Prince Adam's bedroom, a location we saw in numerous season one episodes of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe? Notice that in this scene the humour has been toned down given the hilarity of the previous scene at Snake Mountain. Lucky is incredibly endearing in this scene, it really rounds out the character well. We know that he's doing his best to save Etheria, but the little guy can only do so much. And we're at Castle Greyskull, but for the first time in a while we find ourselves in the rather lovely Travel Corridors room, previously seen in the He-Man episodes She Demon of Phantos, Dawn of Dragoon, and To Save Skeletor. We get an explanation as to why Lucky wasn't frozen here, because he is a creature of magic and therefore cannot be affected by the time machine. It makes sense that the Horde's technology would not hurt magical beings, but this explanation does not really fly. Etheria has always been a magical place inhabited by spellcasters such as Madame Raz, whom we saw at the rebel camp. So why was she frozen? Hmm. Answers on a postcard, please. Nice sequence here of the sorceress creating a dimensional gate. We previously saw this animation in the episode Orko's Missing Magic. I do like the stock walk of He-Man wielding the power sword. It's like a unique take on a very familiar sequence. And now we're back on Etheria. Lucky immediately spots Adora and Spirit here, and then, to be honest, his usefulness pretty much expires in the episode. We're about to see Adora escape the time freeze, but there's a really problematic piece of animation. Adora's hand grabs the Sword of Protection. How? The script calls for He-Man to place the Sword of Protection in her hand, and he could have just kind of balanced it in her hand, but having her hand move and grab it visually, it just looks odd. Nice image here of Adora and He-Man hugging whilst holding their respective swords. I always love seeing stock cells of He-Man that we have seen many, many times during his series with the Whispering Woods behind them. It just instantly makes the animation cells feel kind of new. Bow! Glimmer! You're right, we have much to do. For the honour of Greyskull! As Adora realises everything that has happened and calls upon Greyskull's power, let me share with you one of the earliest and most amusing anecdotes that Robert Lamb told me when we first started talking. You can actually see him tell this anecdote in the interview I previously mentioned that is on this channel. So, after Lou Scheimer saw the rough cut of this episode, he called Robert Lamb and congratulated him on the script. Rob, taking the call in Bob Arkwright's office, was delighted hearing the praise from the president of Filmation. I mean, how could you not? However, the storyboard department, which Rob had recently moved back to, were well aware of the phone call and gave him all kinds of grief, kissing up to the boss, that kind of thing, whilst he was on the phone taking the call and after. Regardless, it's a lovely memory that Rob has, both lovely and funny. And now, finally, He-Man and She-Ra can take control of this episode, which has been dominated by other characters throughout. In what has to be one of their greatest feats, He-Man and She-Ra begin pulling at the time stop device with She-Ra's sword turned to a chain. Their efforts begin to work and the result is a perfectly timed, thrilling catastrophe. Talking about this scene to me, Robert Lamb was very satisfied how this scene turned out visually. Moving something in time should create some wonderful visuals and sure enough, director Mark Lamack ensures that we see moving trees, high speed winds, as well as great grit and determination on the faces of He-Man and She-Ra as time itself begins to warp around them. This is a great scene as the Fright Zone and all of Etheria begins to shake. Hordak has a fantastic line of utter disbelief. But that's impossible! No one can move time! This action scene is one of the series most dramatic. It's scenes like this that make Lucky Lenzerham one of those rare, universally liked episodes. 
No matter how much people detest Lucky, all fans seem to enjoy this first season She-Ra installment. And how can they resist an episode so teeming with characters, colours and surprises? And again, I'll state that even though money was saved in the static shots of the frozen characters, the numerous scenes featuring shadows and all the layering and effects we're seeing right now would have been incredibly expensive. Moving the machine has damaged it. The power that stops time is shaking the entire planet. We've got to open this thing and find a way to stop it before Etheria is shaken to pieces. This epic scene culminates in a glorious image, as we're about to see, of She-Ra and He-Man destroying the time stop device with their swords. Get ready for it, because it looks awesome. And look at all of those shadows and overlay effects, my goodness. I think you're right. We must destroy it now. And hurrah, the day is saved. And the pillow against the tree is a really lovely touch. Also, yeah, this image of Orko and Lucky shaking hands, it is rather lovely. It actually appears on the back of the VHS box, if I remember rightly. One thing I haven't really talked about is Lucky's powers. Yes, we know he hides, but he does have the ability to teleport short distances. I love the animation we're about to see, which shows She-Ra kick the time stop device all the way back to the Fright Zone. It's wonderful. Get this mess cleared out of here! Yes, my order. And we get a great end to this episode with Mantena fixing the time stop device. I love Imp and Hordax pleading with him to not continue to fix the device. <laughs> Mantena, don't! Leave it alone! Robert Lamb's script states that Hordak should chase Mantena around the Fright Zone in a series of static animation cells firing non-animated laser blasts to suggest the reverse effects of the time stop device. Thus we come to the end of Lucky Lends a Hand. Lucky Lends a Hand is a dream come true for He-Man and She-Ra fans, a melting pot of all their favourite characters poured over a single episode. But if any character can be singled out as the dominant one, it is the titular character, Lucky, who miraculously makes the transition from moral guide to gentle forest creature without irritating us. Lucky lends a hand legitimizes Lucky as never before, making him a part of the established mythos. Robert Lamb bravely brings Lucky out of hiding, quite literally, and makes him a part of the She-Ra series. And yet, this episode still manages to make Lucky seem separate, somehow apart from the rest. Lucky Lends a Hand remains a testament of how much can be accomplished and seen in one entire episode. You have to be a big fan of Filmation's He-Man and She-Ra to truly appreciate Lucky Lends a Hand, and maybe that is what makes it seem so special. It's truly an episode for the fans, made by the very same fans at Filmation that produce the show. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.